Welcome to topic 1, in which we're going to be looking at light and quantum mechanics. Spectroscopy as a subject can be defined as the study of the interaction of electromagnetic radiation, light, with matter, so in our case atoms and molecules. Light exists as orthogonal oscillating electric and magnetic fields. So if we were to draw a diagram, so we could have our z-axis, which could be our electric field bit E, and our y-axis, which could be our magnetic field B, then the x-axis would be the direction in which the wave is travelling. And then if, as to represent the wave travelling, we can draw in the oscillating electric field, so like a sine wave going up and down, and then along the b-axis I'm just going to change colour, there we go, we perpendicular to this we have the oscillating magnetic field. These waves are characterised by a wavelength, so this, that's the distance between two peaks, and this is lambda, the wavelength, and they also have a certain frequency, so nu, this is a Greek letter nu here. The frequency is the number of oscillations that this wave exhibits in one second. The wavelength and the frequency of light are related, so if you take the wavelength and multiply it by the frequency, it gives you the speed of light, c. So in SI units this is approximately 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. In spectroscopy we'll often use the speed of light in non-SI units, um, in which case we'll often use the speed of light as being 3 times 10 to the 10 centimeters per second. Another fundamental relationship um, which we need to know concerning light is that the energy of the wave of light is proportional to the frequency nu and the proportionality factor h is Planck's constant so this is these are key relationships that, that we need to know and in the rest of this course we'll see Planck's constant appearing time and time again so when light shines on matter the electric field of the light could interact with the molecule or the magnetic field of the light could interact with the molecule and this gives rise to a number of types of spectroscopy so nuclear magnetic spe spectroscopy is associated with the magnetic field interacting with molecules and that's not going to be the topic of this, converse, um, this, this course instead we're going to be thinking about the electric field of the light interacting with the molecules. So when the electric field oscillates it has an effect on the electrons in the molecules and forces them to, to, to react. If the energy of the radiation matches a gap between energy levels in the molecule a transition may occur between these two energy levels. An example is absorption, in which we go from initial state I to a final state F upon absorption of light. Another thing that could happen is if we start off in an excited state, an, an excited initial state I, this, the system can then fall down to a, a final state F and emit light. So we've got two simple processes which can occur, absorption and emission. There are more complicated interactions that can also occur. If, for example, the energy of the radiation doesn't match the gap between two energy levels, you can get scattering. There are two types of scattering that we're going to be interested in. So there's so-called Rayleigh scattering, where the molecule absorbs light, is excited up to a virtual state but falls back down immediately to the final state which is the same as the initial state and gives off light of the same energy that was originally absorbed. Then there is Raman scattering in which 
the molecule absorbs light, is excited to a virtual state, falls back down, but falls back down to a different final state. And because it's a different final state, it means the energy, the light that is emitted, is of a different wavelength or different frequency to the light that was absorbed. Raman scattering is the basis of Raman spectroscopy, which we'll talk about later in the course. So I've introduced absorption and emission and scattering, and I've talked about energy levels, initial levels and final energy levels, but I haven't said anything about what these are. And there are all sorts of types of energy levels in molecules, and so this means that there are all, si all sorts of types of transition. So we've got to think about the energy levels, the, the transitions, and we've got to think about the rules which say whether these transitions are allowed or not. As you might expect, all of these, these rules and um, these energy levels come from quantum mechanics. Um, so there is a, a quantum mechanical view of spectroscopy, and that's based on looking at the wave function and the changes in the wave function from an initial to a final state. So the wave function of the system describes the quantum mechanical state of the system, and it's typically represented by the letter psi, the Greek letter psi. In this course, we're just going to consider so-called stationary states, so where the, the wave function doesn't change as a function of time. When the system is in a stationary state with a wave function psi, this is associated with a specific energy, E, which is obtained by solving the Schrodinger equation for this wave function. So the Schrodinger equation we've seen before, H psi is equal to E psi, where H is the Hamiltonian operator. In this course, we're going to be thinking about different types of wave functions. We're going to be thinking about rotational, vibrational, and electronic wave functions. So we're going to be thinking about rotational, vibrational, and electronic energy levels and transitions between them. The total wave function of the system, so if you have a molecule, the total wave function is a product of the various component wave functions. So psi total is given by the electronic wave function, psi elec, multiplied by psi vib, so the vibrational wave function, multiplied by the rotational wave function, multiplied by the translational wave function. The energy of the system is given by the sum of the various energies. So the total energy is the sum of the electronic, vibrational, rotational, and translational energies. To a good approximation, the electronic energy is much larger than the vibrational energy, which is larger than rotational energy, which is larger than the translational energy. So we can actually treat the three types of transition and the three types of energy separately which makes things easier, because we only need to think about one of them at a time. So we've now, we can now imagine that we solve the Schrodinger equation for whatever wave function, so the vibrational wave function, and it gives us vibrational energy levels. So now we need to think about whether we're allowed to go from one vibrational energy level to another vibrational energy level. And that depends on selection rules. So a lot of this course is going to be looking at selection rules for processes. Selection rules um, come from quantum mechanics and they can often be rationalised in terms of symmetry. The important thing um, is the so-called transition dipole moment. And this tells us whether a transition is allowed or not. It's effectively a measure of the shift in electronic distribution during a transition. For a transition to be allowed, and in, when we're thinking about quantum mechanics, it, this is always in terms of probabilities. So for a transition to have non-zero probability, the transition dipole moment must be non-zero. This transition dipole moment can be written um, using an equation. So mu fi, well let's have a look, so the psi f and psi i are the wave functions corresponding to the initial and final states. 
we've got mu with a hat on in the middle of this equation and this is the dipole moment operator and it's effectively a vector which gives us a transition between the initial and final states and we integrate this overall space and it gives us mu fi mu fi is just a number and it's a number that can be calculated and it can be thought of as the overlap between the initial and final state wave functions in the presence of an electromagnetic field. So as I said it's a number you can work it out um, and once you've worked it out if you square it this tells you how intense the transition is going to be. So of course if the number is equal to zero you square it you get zero this says that the transition will have no intensity which means the transition is not allowed. If mu fi is a large number, you square it, it gets even larger, and then this means this will be a, a strong transition. Symmetry actually allows us um, lots of shortcuts for calculating whether a transition is going to be allowed or not, um, but we're not going to be considering this as part of this course. OK, this brings us to the end of topic one. So now your homework is to go and read sections 11.1 .1 to 11.3 of Housecroft and Constable.